people in front. I don't typically walk on the stage barefooted, but my shoes were bugging me, so it was the, you know, the summer shoes I kept tripping up. So anyway, but uh, typically when people hear that I am an astronomer, they always find it very odd how I could have ended up uh, as a data scientist when I finally left academia. And this has become even worse now that I've switched again to focus primarily on the visualization of data. But with images like this solar cap, I'd say that astronomy is probably one of the most artfully or visually oriented of the exact sciences. And with more than a billion stars in our Milky Way alone, we have more than enough data to play around with. So for me personally, a switch to a data visualization designer seems like a perfectly normal extension of astronomy. But although I, I sort of dabbled with visualization during my data scientist years, I've only truly been focused on it for the past two-ish years. And I found that in data visualization, I tend to be a perfectionist. I love spending hours and hours on some small detail to make it exactly as I have in mind. Uh, however, typically, usually what I have in mind isn't quite the default setting or what all of the examples are using. And that forces me to try and be creative with the available charts and tools, like using a donut chart to create a radial bar chart, for example. And you don't have to be some sort of code wizard to go beyond the norm. By combining existing charts and forms and layouts in inventive ways, you can assign a new meaning to the whole. Or even simply reusing an existing chart in a different manner can open up more possibilities for uh, new data displays. And don't underestimate the power that a good use of fonts and color and hierarchy can have on the end result in terms of effectiveness and visual appeal. Of course, if you want to go for drastic changes, you can just even sort of go into the underlying source code and turn an existing chart into something completely different, but based on somebody else's fantastic work. And this is sort of regardless of the tool. I've hacked my way through PowerPoint and Keynote and ClickView Tableau R, although I'm now mostly focused on D3 uh, due to the creative freedom that it brings me. And D3 is a JavaScript library that has become the standard for online data visualization and what I'm using for all of the examples that you see here. So in the next 35-ish minutes, I want to take you through several projects that highlight the different ways that you can go beyond the norm in the visualization of data. And these are all examples of projects that I did either while working for Agen as a database designer, uh, or in, uh, as a personal project, which of course then is by night mostly, or by in my weekends. Um, and even if I was brave enough, then I might show you some screenshots of the very first thing that appeared on my screen before taking you through the choices, mistakes, and improvements that I made to, that evolved them to their final states. And hopefully by the end, you'll be driven to take your next data visualization beyond the norm, beyond the default, take a look at it from a different angle to get the most effective and engaging result possible. So the place that uh, I, I work for still uh, part-time, Agen, handles payments. So they want to make sure that there's sort of the middleman in between you and the store where you want to buy an item or a service from. And, and they want to get as many good transactions through regardless of whatever payment method you are using or whatever bank the store is using. Well, of course, Agen also loves to catch fraudsters. And the project that I'll show you now, called the Shopper DNA, is a way developed to visualize more complex cases of fraud. And it's not a visualization that you can understand right after you see it. But this is used primarily by people that do nothing else than investigate fraud the entire day. So for them, it's worth the initial investment that it needs to understand this chart. OK, so it's not the best screenshot. But uh, this is how the first version of the Shopper DNA looked when I joined Agen about a year and a half ago. So what is visualized here is how one transaction can be connected to 13 other transactions through payment identifiers. And these 14 transactions together all had the same email address, three different credit card numbers, and two known IP addresses. And for the second version, I first diverged a bit, but eventually I came back to the same basic setup. However, this time, these payment identifiers had been scaled to show how often it had been used in all of the transactions. And I sectioned off groups of the same payment identifier, like uh, email address or shopper ID. But if you look at this in an abstract sense, it's really a combination of three separate things. So the inner lines are part of D3's little known layout called hierarchical edge bundling. Well, these size circles, they're nothing special. You see them in scatter plots and bubble charts quite often. And the very thin outer edges are really just a teeny tiny donut chart. But by combining these three charts, the shopper DNA had been customized 
into something new that was exactly fitting to revealing the insects. And one thing I also quickly want to discuss is colors. So, although finding a good color palette can be difficult in any field of visual design, I personally feel that it might be most difficult in data visualization, because then colors also have a direct meaning. So for my payment identifiers, which are categories, I need to find a palette that looks good together and is easily distinguishable. I often start out with a rainbow because it has many distinct hues, but I couldn't use red, which was already in use in an outer ring representing something else. And yellow is often too bright, grasping the attention of the viewer more than any of the other colors, whereas all of these identifiers are of equal importance. But I wasn't liking the result in colors. And then somebody suggested, why don't you use a pastel rainbow? It's like, okay, I can try that. I made a palette and sketch, applied it to my data, and then press refresh, and then made a screenshot and never uh, saw this palette again. Because it was like, this is not professional looking. Uh, I tried a more earthy tones, uh, even in trying out the red, but that just wasn't working. And then I asked my, some of my coworkers in the design team, and five people had a two-hour meeting about colors. And one of my favorite things that came from that meeting is that the design team actually got some respect for how difficult colors can be in data visualization. Uh, but this is what we came up with. Just blues and greens. But even there, you have to be careful. Because if you make one half blues and the other half greens, people are going to see that as two separate groups, which they aren't. And even within a color, in data viz, it's often the case that lighter, if you have like light green, green to dark green, the darker green is of higher value, which again isn't the case here. So we really have to think about how to alternate these colors to make it just distinguishable colors, nothing else. So this is what we went to user testing, and what results did we get? Well, they told us, we don't really need to see the distinction, distinction between these payment identifiers. Uh, we can read that off from the labels. We actually want to see more in this outer ring. So I turned them all dark blue. Quite easy, if only I'd known that weeks before. Um, one other thing I actually added is that if the circle gets quite big, which is often an indication of fraud, I only show the most often used identifiers. And then if you hover over something, everything that is connected does become visible. But it's a way to make the visual less daunting to look at when you go into it. And it also focuses the attention of the user on what are probably the most important identifiers. So this project was, the previous project now, was about circles and lines and connecting. But typically in data viz, when you're talking about connecting circles, you're talking about a network. Which brings me to another project I did at Ajay. So the company exists now for about 10 years, but they really try and keep that startup vibe going. And in typical Dutch style, there's virtually no hierarchy in the way people interact. But if you look at the company from an HR perspective, it's still very much a pyramid with a CEO at the top. So when HR came to me uh, requesting a new organizational chart, they had two demands. It had to be dynamic, so updating whenever new employees were added, uh, but it also should not portray the pyramid vibe. So instead, I went with a network because then it appears as if people are lying more in the same plane of equality. Well, I got some data to play around with from HR. And this really is the first time I had something on my screen instead of just red error messages in my console. And you can already see the network being built up here on the right. You know, people being connected to their manager. And in an abstract sense again, this is the network. It's what it does. It's not, nothing more than this. But I can't really give this back to HR and tell them, well, good luck, here's your network, and uh, I'm moving on. It needed a lot more, both in terms of design and interactivity. So the first thing I turned my attention to were teams. So how to make it visually more clear who was in the same team. And um, sometimes I have this thing that during early development, often all my colors are rainbow, like my mandatory rainbow face. It just makes the screen more fun to look at, but typically I often move on to other colors eventually. But anyway, the first thing I tried to do this so was having automatically calculating a shape that would go around all the team members automatically. But I could never make that look smooth. It was always clunky with these weird shapes going on. Uh, so I tried some different things, but eventually I came back to just using circles. Because you know they, they might take up a bit more space, but due to their smooth symmetrical shapes, they make the whole appear less cluttered. And then the only thing I had to figure out was 
how small can I make the circle and where should I position that so it would encapsulate the teams. So next up were the nodes, as circles are typically called in a network. Or in even better terms, my colleagues. Well, in the meantime, I'd come to understand that I would have access to photos of my colleagues. But I still wanted to use an outer ring of color representing the function that that person had within the team. So they'd become quite big and start to overlap. Of course, that is not fair to the people being overlapped. So I made a version where nothing would overlap, but that took up so much space that you lost the structural view of the network. And again, trying different things than what I ended up with was this where two people could still slightly overlap, but where that would happen, the, uh, the overlap would be cut away. And I really liked the visual analogy that that gave of these, each team was now a little group of frog spawn clinging together. And I, also in the, in the idea that you do work together with people throughout your company, but typically you work most closely together with your direct team members. And I created this sort of uh, partial clipping by using a Voronoi technique. And I've made the Voronoi cells visible here. And it's a very handy technique, and I'll show you a few more uses for it later on. But what it does, in essence, is it splits up a plane in such a way where each of these cells surrounds one point in such a way that everything that lies within this cell lies closest to the point in the cell than it does to all, any of the other points outside of the cell. OK, so as a bit of background, in D3, a network is simulated by using gravity and charges. So when you press refresh, the network is first bouncing around trying to find some form of equilibrium of pushing and pulling. And I've made a movie where I've just pressed refresh, and it's awful, I've also visualized these Voronoi cells. So hopefully it'll become a little bit more clear what these cells, how these sort of function around these circles. I also figured out that if you uh, forget to update the Voronoi grid and instead plot an entirely new one on each animation frame, you get a rather psychedelic result. <laughs> It's some sort of 3D thing going on, but anyway. The next challenge was consistency. So in D3's previous version, because I made this right before, of course, right before the new version came out, um, the networks was, network was created randomly. So on each refresh, all of these points were just put onto the screen in different locations. So on each refresh, my, my network was oriented completely differently. The green blob is somewhere else every time. But for somebody coming into this visualization, trying to find their colleagues, that's not very useful if they have to reorient themselves every time. There has to be some sort of consistency. However, I didn't want to have to specify or predefine the positions of these people because that would defeat the purpose of it being dynamic. So instead, I went with sort of a hybrid approach where I would fix the positions of some people, but only based on very generic, generic uh, characteristics. So I fixed the CEO in the center, the board around him in a circle, and then the first layer outside of the board would be in the same general direction, but with a slight random offset, and then the same for every level deeper. And then I would let gravity take over. And now it's much more certain in which direction these, uh, these groups will fly out, because it is just physics what, it, what it's based on. Well, people don't actually need to see this animation, they just need to see the end result. So after a few more uh, design tweaks, this, oh wait, well, actually this is what happens then. Uh, if you I mean, it's, it's not perfectly consistent now, but it's consistent enough for people. I mean, people aren't going to remember that it's over there or it's over there. But this is how it then looked in sort of the visual way. Okay, so now people can see how Agen looked in the structural sense a few months ago, but it's not very usable yet. It needed a lot of interactivity. But typically, I don't start on adding interactivity until I feel that the, the visual form is close to its end state. So and I, I don't mean in terms of colors and design and such, uh, but more like really the abstract form. Because even, uh, even though interactivity can be paramount, like it is over here, it will never turn a bad visual chart or form into a good one. But also, actually, I don't really enjoy implementing interactivity. Uh, I always have these clashing events of hovers and clicks and ifs and else and stuff, and I hate that. And also, the visual on my screen isn't changing that much anymore. So psychologically, it feels as if I'm at a standstill. But again, it was really needed here. And with 400 people and counting, one of the most important things is to add a search box. And I guess I'm not one of the people that know all of the design axioms. Uh, <laughs> but I'm like more of the 
Uh, everybody starts in the top left person. Uh, so uh, let me show you where I'm at. So that's me. I have some very interesting colleagues, as you can see. Um, but this is just very simple interactivity. If you hover over a person, you see what that person is. Uh, and we can give ourselves our job titles. I particularly like this one. Visual Art Implementer of Graphic and Interaction Design and Branding Communicator. It, it's way it's away with words, though. <laughs> well, uh, so yeah, simple hover. Um, if I go to somebody else, I was always a fan of Flareon. Um, yeah, now I have a click, which is nothing more than fixing a hover. So if I click on somebody else, I fix that person. I can pan around this, I can zoom out, uh, zoom in. So, and the, the final thing is these functions, so what do people actually do within the teams. So it's very basic interactivity, really nothing much is happening, but it was the difference that turned this chart into something that people could not use, into, see people, into something that people can use and understand how a colleague fits into the organization, how to reach them, who their manager is, and so on. So, in the, the previous project, I used this Voronoi technique to get rid of the overlap. But it can be very handy for increasing UX and data visualization as well. So here we have a very standard scatter plot where we have life expectancy on the vertical and GDP per capita on the horizontal for about 200 countries in the world. And they're sized according to the total GDP and colored according to the region in which they lie. And when I see this, I want to know which circle is which country. But there are too many to label separately, so what is typically done in the web world is to give them a tooltip. And typically, if we have, say, a variable of circles that represents these circles, we attach the mouse over event to these circles, and we attach the tooltip to the thing that is mouse overed. But here, I have this sort of sparse region, and I've made the circles quite big, but it still is a very, it takes a lot of effort for me to sort of get a sense of this region. I really have to try and move my mouse very specifically. And so I thought, well, can't I overlay that with a Voronoi grid and attach the mouse over to these cells? So now wherever I go, I have a tooltip. But yeah, it doesn't really make any sense to have these tooltips hovering over these cells. So what you can do is you can give the cell and the circle within the cell some class that is unique to themselves and different to everybody else, like country code in this case. So in that sense, the mouse over is still triggered by the Voronoi cell, uh, but the tooltip is attached to the circle with the same class. Well, we don't need to see these cells, they're just there to do the thing under the hood. Uh, but now it gets a lot easier to get a sense of this sort of sparse region over here, and it still works perfectly fine in these dense regions. So I made a, I made a tutorial on how to recreate this effect, and then a few months later, uh, somebody came with a very good improvement. They actually told me, well, if I'm over here, I'm so far away from any of the circles, I don't really expect to see a tooltip yet. So what he did was, he combined the Voronoise with distance limiting circles. So now I only see a tooltip when I'm hovering over these blue circles. So now the blue circles capture the mouse over, but they are cut according to the Voronoise. And again, this is all happening under the hood, you don't need to see that. But that's how something as default or as simple as a scatter plot can still be improved upon beyond the default to make it more user friendly uh, for anybody who's going to sort of want to investigate and find the insights from this chart. But Voronoi's can also be used very well for line charts because line charts are in essence just a collection of points connected by a line. And very many fascinating analyses of baby names have been done in the past, such as the most trendy or poisoned or unisex name. But I was interested in something much more simple. I just wanted to know how have the most popular baby names risen and fallen from fame over the past years. And here is my end result. Where each of these lines is a name, we have uh, the years going on the horizontal, and then the position in the top 10 on the vertical. So for example, in 18, uh, 1887, we had Jessica, was the popular, most popular girl name in the US. After that, we have Ashley, Amanda, Sarah, and so on. And the color is, accorded, is coded to the starting letter of a name, and the thickness represents the highest position that name ever reached. So we can see here, for example, that Jennifer was number one once, but Lauren never got above number nine. 
And I don't actually have to hover over any of these lines to grab a hold of it in a way. Uh, I, and it's again a Voronoi doing the thing. And since we have a top 10 for every year, the Voronois are just a rectangular grid. And I can increase this time scale, and the Voronois just update right along with it. So sometimes I make elaborate sketches of what I want to create, but more often than not, my sketches are very simple. But um, although simple, this sketch does contain sort of the visual form that is the main abstract form of my end result. And I knew I couldn't design it any better on paper. This is really the only sketch I made. Because I had to get the actual data on my screen and then continue to design with code. Because, I, and I, do, I find myself doing that more and more often since it's, the data just has such a great impact on your design choices. But this is the very first time I had something on my screen. And I mean, it's not looking pretty at all. The lines aren't connecting, they're very jagged, axis is in the wrong location. Basic D3 color scheme, but you just start changing every little thing and see where that leads you. So making sure the lines connect, having proper axes, rainbow face, having a, a time picker at the bottom. Uh, and but sadly, these are the only two images that I had on my computer that I could find of early development. But there is one other thing that I have that I'd like to share. And that's, although I only show the top 10, I actually have the information for the entire top 100. So if we look at how these names behave below the top 10, we get this. And I find it very interesting to see that a name can rise out of nowhere into like a top 3 position within just a few years. But once they fall out of the uh, top, top 10, which is quite easy here, it can take decades before they're out of the top 100. And if you think about it, it makes sense, but I always like it when sort of the data actually shows that, shows that it's there. So although this sort of Voronoi makes it the mouse over event easier, I think it's actually, personally, I think it's this small chart below that makes the biggest difference in making this chart more effective. And I hope the people in the back can sort of see it though. Um, the thing is, when I was looking for the data, I, I found out that it was available until 1880. However, a typical screen isn't wide enough to do justice to 135 years of volatile change. So I employed this technique of focus and context, in which you have a small chart at the bottom, all the way over there, that shows all of the data. And then from that, you select a small window uh, that is then visualized in big above. And the user can then select whatever portion that they want from the entire region to focus on. And I thought, well, I'd seen the use of this focus and context technique, or main and mini chart, only for line charts. But wouldn't that be very useful for bar charts as well? So for my next dashboard that I made for Agen, I put in something that I called a brushable bar chart, and where a brush is just a technical term for this window. And although a colleague of Noah, I guess, let me first explain. So in this setup, we would have a mini chart showing all of your bars, and we, you select a small section that would then be visualized on the left of the main chart that you can actually read. And, and a colleague of mine would then figure out sort of how to build the rest of the report, and I would sort of then have to figure out how to build this inside of the charting framework that we have at Agen. And sadly, there weren't any ready-made examples on Stack Overflow. There were some things, but nothing was advanced enough. So I thought, well, no worries, I'll start from a bar chart and figure it out from there. Uh, but then I learned why there weren't any ready-made examples. And let me quickly explain the essence. So for a line chart, we have continuous data, uh, and uh, like time. And this one runs from 1950 to 1970. And this main chart really only knows about that time frame that you've given it. But if I want to make that window three times as big, I can extrapolate this axis in a way and say that it should run from 1930 to 1990, and then I can request the data for that. But if we have these three bars, like these three movies, and I want to make that three times as big, well, this is not actually even an axis, so there's no way to extrapolate what comes left or right based on what I know. So this is sort of the essence of the problem. But I, I still wanted to have this thing, so how can I sort of work around that. And my first idea was to have this mini chart sent through the data to the main chart, which would then re-render. That gave it quite a lot of headaches in terms of transitions, so let me show you. Here we have just a random 
bar chart of the top 50 world bike grossing movies. And please ignore the rainbow gradient again, just to make the slide look more interesting. But if you move this down a bit, you see that the movies that go away, they move out, the ones that stay move up, and the new ones move in. Whereas you would expect actually this to move up and down simultaneously. But as I said, this, this big chart only knows about what you've given it. So it either knows about five bars, or four bars, or three bars. It doesn't know about half bars. So it was, that was very weird to look at. So I had to wait and do transitions. But transitions take time, so people I can't do anything when somebody's moving this thing up and down only when they let go. And like I said, you can only sort of send through whole bars. So I had to write all kinds of ugly code to make sure that this window would snap to complete bars no matter if you make it bigger or move it or click it. But anyway, it was working in a way. It was doing what I wanted it to do. So I made this dummy example, sent it out on, uh, online again, and then somebody came with a very good improvement as I'd hoped. They told me, why don't you use clipping instead? And that was such a different way of thinking and a much better idea. So in this, in this case, both of these bars know about all of the data, but most of this big chart is clipped away. And then when somebody moves this window, all you have to do is send through the new top and bottom pixel location so that these visual portions are in sync. So with that change, we now have this which is much more what you expect to have, and much more intuitive to the user uh, how left and right are connected. And again, yeah, now you can have half bars, so all that code could disappear as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and here is a, a simple dummy example of how that ended up in the report in, uh, at Agen. Uh, we actually have three different bar charts, and you can sort of sort on one, and that then becomes sort of uh, the, the brushable portion. And the target color here is red, because chargebacks, this is what this uh, report was about, is synonym to fraud, so uh, that's why the bad color is bad for European standards. All right, so moving away from the Voronoi's and the brushable charts, I want to end with two projects that took the same basic chart and then used them for wildly different data and different visual end results. And working on a fun project at my previous employer, Deloitte, I had access to a data set that contained what education people had done and then what occupation people were doing a year and a half after graduation. And we wanted to visualize these flows from education to occupation. And I could have used a Sankey diagram, which is very good at showing flows. But uh, I, I like circular things. I like hexagonal things even more, but I mean, it's a good halfway point. Um, and so I wanted to, and it was, it was going to be used by the media, uh, so I wanted to have something that was a bit more eye-catching. And I made this sketch where I sort of had this circular Sankey diagram, had some screenshots online that sort of showed the idea, showed it to my manager, and thankfully he loved it, but then I had to build it. Only problem was that I didn't know that this design existed in any of the charting tools that I was aware of. So therefore I instead decided to um, start from something that was closest to what I could find and then see if I could transform that into my visual uh, circular flow design. Well, in D3 there is a chart that's called a chord diagram. How many people here have heard the term? A few. <laughs> how many people know how to actually read the chart? None. <laughs> yeah, so that's part of the problem. So uh, I really like this chart because it's circular. And it can also show an immense amount of data, but it's very notorious for being quite difficult to understand on the first try. Um, but I felt that this, this was probably the closest thing that I had to my circular flow design, so I, I wanted to start from there. And just because I can't resist, I'm going to try and explain to you how you can get information from this chart. So what this chart shows is how, uh, well actually, is uh, for an imaginary population of people, their own hair color, and the hair color they would prefer on their partner. Okay, uh, so the outer ring represents the actual distribution of hair colors. So about 30,000 people have black hair, and about 40,000 people have brown hair. So if we then focus on one of these inner cords, as they're called, uh, here, the bottom one, again, sorry, back, people in the back, uh, this one is about 16,000 people wide. And then we can follow. So these 16,000 people with brown hair prefer a partner that has blonde hair. And then vice versa, there are about 
20,000 people that have blonde hair, but only 2,000 of these people who prefer a partner that has brown hair. And it might have been a bit too fast still, <laughs> but I hope I've at least been able to convince you that you can get insights from this chart. Um, but anyway, for my, what I wanted to do, it was actually much simpler than that. I, I just had to make sure that everything on the left was flowing to the right. And this is sort of me trying to figure out how I could hack the data because it wasn't meant to do these things uh, to make that happen. Okay, cool, that was working the way I wanted to. But how to get this gap in the middle? Well, if I just sort of add an extra chord that doesn't represent any data, rotate the entire thing so it's nicely in the center, and then hide it all together. So now I was at the point that I sort of was, had the thing that I showed my manager, and I created it without too much trouble. I mean, I just looked at this other chart in a more abstract sense and saw how I could use that for what I wanted to do. But to be honest, I wasn't quite happy with the result yet. In my mind, these two halves were pulled apart a bit more. And although I could easily move these outer sections outward, for these inner chords, I had to dive into V3's source code for the very first time and make some teeny tiny adjustments. It wasn't anything special, it was just some horizontal offsets, but that was something I could not have done with the available options. That was really the hacking part of the code. Well, some custom sorting to reduce overlap, and now I was finally at my desired end result. And I again created a blog, uh, how, to, how to do this, I called it the stretched chord diagram, uh, shared it on Twitter, and then people started calling it the bat plot, which I thought was a really more fetchy name, I'm not good with names. But here is the actual end result. But we have educations on the left and occupations on the right. And just to make that flow from left to right a little bit more intuitive, I filled the chords with a, uh, a muted gradient going from one side to the other. But as I told you, in, in data viz, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, almost as an OCD. So even though you couldn't see them, it was still bugging me that these dummy chords were there. If you really wanted to, you could select them in the DOM. And also the data had to be structured in a very specific way with symmetries and zeros going on. So it was, could be difficult for people to sort of get a grasp of. So I, th I, I told myself then, like the next time, next time that I'm going to create a new chart, I'm going to do it right and create a new function instead of hacking an existing one. And then a few months later, the opportunity arose to do just that. And coincidentally enough, it was again connected to a chord diagram. So for about 10-ish months now, I've been doing a monthly collaboration with uh, Shirley Wu, who is a data visualization designer in San Francisco, called Data Sketches. And each month, we pick a topic, and we both create a visualization around that topic. Uh, but besides sharing the end result, we also write about the process of data finding, preparing, sketching ideas, and actually coding it all up. And for our very first month, the topic was movies. And although I don't have a favorite movie, it really depends on my mood, but it's probably some sort of sci-fi fantasy action adventure-ish thing, I do have a favorite trilogy, and that's The Lord of the Rings. It's more than 11 hours of film, like I watch year after year, I've even watched the uh, 24 hours of extras more than once. Anybody else? Thank you. <laughs> yes, you few have. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I, I went online trying to find some data about the movies. Surprised to not find that there was that much until I came across a real gem. Somebody had created a data set that counted the number of words spoken by each character in each scene of all three extended editions of The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> How amazing is that? I knew I had to visualize that. <laughs> and my angle was, um, how many words has each member of the fellowship spoken at each location? So I started sketching out ideas, and I, came, I quickly came onto something like this, where we have the fellowship members in the center, and then the locations around that in a circle, and then they would be connected by these chords where the thickness of the chord would represent the number of words spoken by that character at that location. But as you might see is that this visual is of the sketch is very similar to a chord diagram. So I knew I could probably start from there, but I also knew that getting these chords to flow towards the center was so far beyond the available options of the diagram that you know, even with a mountain of outside the box thinking, you could not make that happen. I really had to dive into the underlying source code and, and turn this into my own thing. 
So on a lovely summer Sunday, I decided to remain inside and figure this out, like any sane person. Uh, and I don't, I don't typically think very far ahead. So I think in small steps. What is the most important thing I have to figure out now? Can I make that happen? Yes. Good. Next step. Can no. Compromise and figure out a new path. And my first, well, I, I thought the most important step to see if I could actually make this happen was see if I could make these chords flow towards the center. And that actually took less time than anticipated, which is very odd for me in coding, uh, but very heavy. And we're getting rid of this excess space, and now it was ready to handle the actual Lord of the Rings data. Well, we have nine members of the fellowship, so making sure the centers at a end at the right vertical location, some sorting to reduce overlap, and now came something fun with math and SVG paths, because here in the bottom, especially in the top, I th these weird things were happening with these chords due to the way sort of the SVG pads were calculated. So I dove completely into SVG pads, learned about quadratic Bercier curves and the other one that I always forget, um, and started making changes to try and make this, these chords look more natural. I never know where to end. Oh, that was it. <laughs> so now it's, like, it's more like they're, they're being pulled up or they're hanging down, just to make it look a little bit more uh, fitting to this particular chart that I had in mind. Well, it's time for some more appropriate colors, but things were looking very squished. And I, I, I knew that this chart could use some space in the top and bottom. Well, I had done that before, uh, but this time I was going to do it right. No more dummy chords, but just supplying an empty percentage to a function, and then the function would figure out the rest. First, I took a few steps to get right, but eventually this is where I ended up at the end of that lovely summer Sunday. But there are many chords visible here, or strings, or whatever you want to call them, so it needed interactivity to make it more fun to play around with. And it's again very simple interactivity. I hover over uh, a location like the Shire to see who actually spoke in the Shire. Or vice versa, uh, hover over the person so you can see where that person spoke. But I also really hide where that person didn't speak. Because it isn't always about showing the data, it's also about hiding what's irrelevant. And the final thing is sort of that I added a small piece of text for each of these characters about something that I'd come to understand from this data. And my favorite one is this, um, that even though a Boromir, who is really only alive during one movie, he manages to speak more than Legolas does in three. <laughs> I didn't know that, but it's still my favorite finding. Uh, and he speaks a lot on the, on the mountain when they walk up. Uh, and I also, of course, spend way too much time trying to, and I don't even know for sure, uh, the Elvis translations of each of these locations to add as these back things suck. <laughs> as, <laughs> so usually these topics in the months are things we're, we're both very interested in, like Dragon Ball Z or Harry Potter, these kinds of things. Um, but anyway, what I found from all of these more elaborate projects is that I never just pluck my own data set into somebody else's example and then call it finished. Every data has its own unique quirks and insights that require adjustments to the default to show the information most effectively and make it visually appealing. I mean, it doesn't have to be as advanced as I like to do it, but even using a more appropriate color palette than the default can be enough. I always feel that nothing speaks, um, I guess, uninterested more than just not using the just using the default color palette. When I see a tablet or click a few default color tablet a palette or like a keynote. One, I'm like, ugh, that person was not interested in this data. Well, anyway, <laughs> I also never start from scratch. Uh, I, you know, people have done wonderful things and they share this or a way to recreate that online. And the quote by Kirby Ferguson that everything's a remix of something else holds very true to me. Although, I might not consider it a remix when I'm designing something, but when I look at my final design and I compare that to what's out there already, I see the commonalities and I start from something that lies very close to my design. So I hope that by taking you through the design journey through these sort of projects has shown you how even the most basic starting point can turn into its own unique project. That by designing and, and combining and reusing and hacking, you can create something that is tailored to your data and your insights. So the final seconds I want to use for one project that I did for the Olympics, and I took loads of screenshots. So many that at some point I thought maybe the design process can speak through itself through screenshots. And I was actually um, 
inspired by a peacock feather. So in, at the start, I really tried to get this feather shape into the circular elements. Uh, but then I, I showed the, you can see it's sort of happening here. I showed it to a designer friend of mine, and he was like, yeah, lose those feather tips. But I had to take a day before I could actually do that, because that was quite a lot of mathematics going on there. Uh, but eventually, it was for the best. So here's where that turned out. And you can find tutorials and most of the stuff that I uh, just shown you on my website, visualcinnamon.com. And if you're interested in data visualization, while well, the community really lives on Twitter, so come join me there otherwise. And finally, thank you very much for your attention.